I'll get hammered for some of those projections. They'll be looked at horrific. Go kid yourselves. I don't give a shit, right? I mean, if you want to go and pretend you're only going to lose 5%, good on you, right? Most of you have been kidding yourselves for years. You haven't been losing 30 40%. So it doesn't really bother me. But the reality is that you're going to see a large percentage are not coming back. Welcome to this week's Escape Limits podcast. And today, my guest is Mr. Ian Mullane. Ian's been in the fintech industry for over 20 years. And he's also the founder and CEO of Localize, Vanderfit, and Keep Me AI. In this episode, we talked about the health and fitness sector and not only about what to do whilst businesses are in lockdown, but but more importantly, what they can do and how they should approach when business starts again. So it was a it was a pretty interesting episode. We we covered quite a lot of ground, but I think for anybody that's that's involved in the bricks and mortar health and fitness industry, then there's some really valuable information and insights, and if nothing else, ideas that will probably inspire what to do as we start putting together some of our plans to reopen, hopefully, in the in the coming weeks. I hope you enjoy this episode. And more importantly, we really hope that you're uh, getting value from the content that we're putting out at the moment. We've, we've been focusing around how we can help a lot of our key customers during this, this particular period. So any feedback you can give either through the Escape Fitness social media pages or with my page directly will help us ensure that we get the right information that can help you navigate through what's an extremely difficult situation. So please enjoy the episode. Thanks for listening. Ian, thanks for joining us on the second podcast. And um, it's it's a bit funny because we, we recorded a fabulous podcast which talked about data and what was going to happen in the fitness industry with AI. And it was it was one of those really exciting podcast that I wanted to get out. And literally within a few days of us recording it, we we were hit slap on the nose with this whole corona um, situation. And so our content shifted really to, 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 to be able to provide stuff that was a little bit more relevant. And, um, and so for, other, for, for everybody that's listening, there is a part one, which we will be releasing at some point when we get out of this uh, mess that we all seem to be in at the moment. But, um, you know, I appreciate you reaching out to us because, um, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd sort of mentioned that you, you had some great insight and thoughts and ideas with, within your network about sort of, you know, what your view on the situation at the moment as it relates to the fitness industry. And then also, um, you know, what we need to think about in terms of when this is over. And, and our conversation off camera was, uh, you know, certainly at, at the moment, a lot of people are not really even thinking about it being over. So, um, so thanks really for taking the time in to to join with us on this uh, sort of virtual podcast and um you know let's let's sort of dive straight into it if that's okay with you yeah cool matt looking forward to this fantastic so so ian you know since we last spoke you know what's what's been your view of of, of what's going on at the moment you've got a number of different businesses from social media and you're also very much invested in the fitness space but what, what's your views on sort of you know the last three or four weeks then really well, I, I think that, listen, they're historic. <laughs> that, you know, that, that's the primary thing. Th- these are historic times. They're black swan events. They're a- a- any description that you want to give. Um, the, the reality is that we're moving into a transition period as regards to the industry as well, meaning that in many ways, What has occurred over the last few weeks is proving a catalyst for a lot of drivers that we already had within the industry. And we're seeing them accelerate the online digital growth, which is the more obvious one that's come through. I think there's some Darwinian pressures at play currently where we are going to see a number of, um, should we say, businesses stroke concepts be exposed and because of that, have a high probability of default to non-existence in, in the very near future. Um, and I think we'll also see a great deal of consolidation in the industry. I think that there has been a necessity for it for quite a bit of time. And I think that this will generate a lot of change. So, you know, w- what's happening at the moment is is horrific on virtually every level. Um I do want to 
move myself away from the um, from the news coverage and the day to day. You, you know, I'm a data guy by by definition, and you know, by by everything that I operate in is normally very data related. However, there are so many fundamental flaws with the data presented, even in the most basic mathematical context that I try to move myself away from any of the day-to-day. -day. And, and I, I even asked myself a question at the start of the week. What is it that I believe will occur this week that will inf be informed through the news channels that will allow me to make a different plan to put in place a different action this week that will be for the better outcome for me, the family, and the business? And the reality is nothing. <laughs> there is no news that will come out either this week or next week or the week after that is going to have a material impact on the way we operate socially or as a business. When it comes around to the reduction in, or the, should we say the decrease in the necessity for social distancing, when the lockdown ends, when there is a vaccine produced, whatever the penultimate news that comes out may be, that'll be shared. So what I'm not doing is getting myself tied down into the day-to-day -day detail. It's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It has absolutely no bearing on the actions that I need to take in the business. And it's quite frankly, if you're anything but human, is nothing more than depressing and, and certainly mm -hmm. you know, serves no purpose. So um, I and don't... Just, just, it's just on that, um, Ian, because you're right, you are a data, I call you a data geek, but that, you know, that's your business and, or your, your business is, and, and you, you know, you, you know, creative business from analyzing data and, and, you know, making decisions on it. So if, if just, just for a moment, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world and a lot of business leaders are, are, are kind of looking at the news and you, there's, there's so much data coming at you. Um, and it, you know, definitely it seems to be, you know, some of it's people say is legit. Some of it's questionable. What What's your view? As I suppose, I'll call you a data specialist, really. But you know, what What's your view? Uh, all the numbers that are that are coming out, and and I know you've obviously sort of made your point clear to say, look, you know, the the data is irrelevant. But what What do you see is happening? Are people just trying to sort of take bits of data to create headlines and? get attention is it that they're doing their best to, to to glean data that hopefully people can make decisions on or what what, what do you think is going with that data because it's certainly driving a lot of emotion when when people see these stats but it's also quite conflicting i i think you're, you're right it's driving emotion it's not actually driving action i mean um it, it may well be driving driving action as a federal or at a state or as in a, a country level over here in the uk but from an individual perspective if I was to go out and survey 100 people randomly now and ask them what the death figure was yesterday for their country, their thing, what the infection rate was, they'd have no clue because they have just become numbers. You know, we are always at the mercy of the 24 hour a day news cycle. That is a challenge. It's a challenge for a news editor because they have to find a way to fill the available space. Now, the reality of these numbers as they're being published at the moment is that their inaccuracy comes from either their exclusion of some of the primary data. For instance, in the United Kingdom, the uh, uh, the deaf numbers on a daily basis do not incorporate nursing homes. Now, nursing homes are going to be one of the primary areas where we are going to see an increase in the death rate, particularly when we have infection. But that currently is not being placed into the daily numbers. Now, does that fundamentally change things? Well, the fundamental issue with all of these aspects is that when we look at what degree of confidence do we have that the infection rate in any way represents reality, it, it, it has to be close to zero. Why? Because we're not involved in a comprehensive testing program. In the United Kingdom, we're barely getting to our first line defense. We're never mind in the care homes and then obviously people on the streets. So that infection number is a number. It is a number represented as a derivative of the amount of tests that have been done. Then you've got the, the famous case fatality rate, the number that we all want to logically focus on 
because it gives us an opportunity to understand our own mortality within this particular context. Adds that little bit more drama. But the reality, again, is that number is a derivative of the amount of testing that's being done and therefore can't be accurate until there's a comprehensive program of testing. Currently in around the world, we've got um, case fatality rates ranging from 18% to 0.5% in, in many cases. I mean, in the United States, I think you're about 3.4. We're up around the 10% level. The reality is that in many cases, the case fatality rate is going to very much depend on the health infrastructure that's available in the country, first and foremost. That's why in the Republic of Congo, we'd have a higher expectation to see the 18 and 20 percent than we would see in Germany or the United Kingdom or the United States. So there's that aspect. But we also need to understand that the case fatality rate is only ever going to be understood when we have an entire understanding of the population that is infected with COVID-19. And we are in no danger of that. So if we happen to have 10 people die in a population of 100 tested, then that 10% can very quickly become 0.01%. Um, I think it is difficult in the news cycle to report that death rates have probably been underreported However, do not fear because the infection rate is probably much higher than we expected and therefore the death rate is as a percentage. I think the other aspect is and the very harsh realities are that I am eight times more likely to be a victim of mortality due to COVID-19 if I'm between 70 and 90 than I am if I am between 30 and 40. Those numbers make uncomfortable reading because when that comes to talking about the seriousness of this as an epidemic, it can make it sound like anything that belittles or makes it sound less important is because we're not valuing the seniors in our society at the same level as we're valuing the younger members of our society. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so for, in your perspective, from a business, you know, business point, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm with all these things. It's, it's very easy for, for uh, you know, people can get quite sensitive in terms of what we're talking about. But I think in this conversation, you know, this is very, this is this is related to business. I, you know, certainly from my side, I'm not playing down the seriousness of the situation. But I, I think, you know, in terms of this conversation, it's purely business. So with based on the fact that the data, you know, it's very difficult to to really rely on that data to give you any, as you said in the beginning, to give you anything that's, that's um, that's hard facts to base your business on. Apart from the fact that you know it, this is a terrible situation, how how then do, you know what do you think that the business community should then or you know, I guess two things. One, what are you seeing the business community doing, um, and 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 what do you think you know is your view of of, of what they should be doing? I don't. Um, I, I, can I concentrate more on the second than the, than, than the first, meaning that what, what should they be doing? And the reason being is because I think in many cases at the moment, we're still at a stage where some businesses have had to go through the very emotional situation of having to uh, uh, see an, a large quantity of their staff leave. They've had to get to grips with the, the very harsh reality of their cash position. And in, in some cases, there, it, there is still a paralysis that has gone on. I, I am not seeing a consistent level of activity or proactivity across all of, of my customers and, and, and the industry participants I speak to. What I would suggest is that any operator that is in this environment at the moment needs to stop relying on prediction and just concentrate primarily on preparation. We have to face a reality that the current lockdown measures that businesses find themselves around the world are not going to be the only lockdowns that occur in 2020. There is a very strong probability that between now and September, there will be at least one and maybe two further lockdowns. Now, in a country like the United States, that could be quite state-driven. 
in somewhere like the United Kingdom or Germany, that could be on a countrywide basis. I think the probability that that's going to occur maybe twice, maybe three times in 2020, prior to both the efficiencies of handling the virus, widespread testing, and also obviously a vaccine being available, means that any of us that are currently basing our business forecasts on any a view that we are not going to go through this at least once or twice again in 2020 is making a, a foolish mistake. So where do you where do you I, say that that's, that could happen then? What is is that just a personal view on what what you're seeing happening and you're feeling, or is there any you know is, is there any more to it than that? There it's it is. If we take a look at how this has occurred, we have got a very good understanding that there is a high probability that, as you know, my, from my background being in economics an awful lot of the decision making that needs to be made post this phase one is going to be more driven by an economic necessity of countries and states. There's a necessity to get the workforce back to being operational and productive. That's going to require trade-offs. There is going to be a necessity for them to understand what possible GDP output they could expect in Q3 by having the workforce at least at 80% operational. And the trade-off to that is going to be not just a lightly, but a near definite, um, a, a redefinite bringing back of the virus in a more widespread community, because there's no physiological reason why that would change currently. There's no vaccine out there. There's no reason to believe that temperature and climate is having a widespread effect. So with that being the case, we will have an expectation that when they do reopen schools, reopen businesses, reopen F&B, and God willing, wherever, we'll open the gyms, we will have the ability during that time to have more contact, but that contact is going to come with risk. And with that risk, we have to expect that the governments are likely when they see it occurring again, to bring down the lockdown, even if it is for a shorter period. I, On the gym side, in many of the comments I'm making there, I think the fitness business has a very different problem to consider. And, and that is that even when the social distancing and everything else is relaxed, I firmly believe that the fitness industry is going to find itself held to a different level of standards, bar many. And in this case, you know, even F&B restaurants and pubs, I still think that the regulations and the precautions that will be given to the fitness industry will be in excess. And because of that, that is going to restrict the operator's ability to get back up to where they were or to catch up from where they're coming from because they are going to have restrictions. And those restrictions are going to be around social distancing within, maybe the inability to utilize certain services. And, and I think we would all be aware that there are certain programs and indeed products in our industry, products as in businesses that have particular type of workout programs, which would be difficult to provide the level of hygiene necessary on a per member basis per session that would allow them in turn to have the confidence that they weren't going to become an organization that had the potential to be spreading when it came in rather than say another business, for instance, swimming pools, et cetera, where maybe the prevalence or the challenge is not as great. Mm. And, and do you think then that um, have you considered what that could look like? I know, you know, I've certainly spoke to people where they're thinking that it could be limited numbers within facilities and and periods where they close down and reclean before they let people in. So there's a there's a there's a control in, you know, a certain amount of control in terms of numbers and distancing and, and cleanliness. Have you seen or heard anything that you think is likely to to I, I guess to affect gyms and I know there's different types of models from boutiques where people are pretty much squashed in 40 people in a room to to more of a traditional model where there is a lot more uh you know sort of space around people I think the challenge is 
Um, if you think of uh, the, the two areas which are obviously going to be in the Group X environment within the studios, um, I uh, attended a, a webinar, um, an Ursa webinar, uh, maybe in two or three weeks ago. You know, time <laughs> time has just blared, but it was uh, a webinar that was held by um, Ursa, and it had uh, Colin, the CEO of Pure, over in Asia, and he was able to take us through the you know what they are going through since they've come out of lockdown in China. And you know the, the the type of rules and regulations which they're having to go through, and you know the rules and regulations which they are having to go through are inclusion, are obviously of having to take temperatures on the way in. That's one of them as a as a more obvious one. They're only allowed to have a certain quantity of people. They need to be able to show the physical spacing during those particular periods, and it is that type of aspect. Um, another one which I think is is important is. Um, if I'm coming in to do, um, if I'm going to go and do a Barry's, for instance, in the Barry's environment, I've got a, a, a much higher probability of being able to utilize a set amount of equipment within my, my, my particular physical space. And therefore, because of that, the ability for the operator to then come and clean afterwards is higher than if I was to go to an environment where I was in a circuit orientation and I am sharing that equipment with multiples. I think that there is probably going to be guidance given relative to whether that would be something that they would, that countries on a case by case basis would be comfortable with because mm. the probability would be a lot higher that there is going to be challenges there should individuals over a prolonged period be sharing sets of equipment on a regular basis, day in, day out, hour by hour. Mm, that's that's an interesting one. I hadn't thought about that, but it you know make, makes sense, I suppose. If you are, you know, where people move around from strength machines to cardios in that circuit type of environment, where you are, you know, kind of spreading stuff around. I suppose having these individual stations where you come in, you work out for thirty or forty minutes, and then you leave, and then you clean. I suppose yeah. um, it is certainly. It seems I'm, I may be wrong, but it seems to be kind of more more controllable, um, which is an interesting one. <laughs> it, it it is. I mean, the, you know, we, we're still at relative early stages. We're still learning about transmission. That seems to be something which is you know developed over the the last six to seven days, where there's a much better understanding of the the, the range that an individual can actually be infecting. But you know, I, I think that. Um, all of those factors are regulatory or potentially regulatory. I think what we need to understand is that consumers will have their own standards. Mm -hmm. We would be naive to believe that consumers will not have reluctance to place themselves in those environments when this lockdown ends. And it is to the operator's responsibility to help with that particular task. And the way that they're going to be able to do that, quite frankly, is by making sure that their cleaning crews and their processes around that are front and center. It's never been a more important aspect. It's never been more of an important time than rather than giving your class schedules and helping them to understand the variety that is available, that front and center, your health is the most important thing that I have responsibility for. And part of that is I would like to share with you very clearly what we as an organization do day in, day out, hour after hour, minute after minute, so that we can make sure this is the safest environment for you to come and participate in. Mm. However, should something happen relative to a, an infection reported, I'd like to tell you what the process is that we go through that we will immediately go into a lockdown for a period of 24 hours, that we will have a cleaning crew that will come in and do a deep clean on the facility. These are the type of things which are necessary. There are many of us in society who will feel comfortable with the risk that this virus presents us, but there will be many and probably the majority that will not, not because of how they fear about their own mortality, but I was, what effect them catching it could present to the risks in their extended family. That is wow. going to be one of the major challenges about getting foot traffic back into fitness institutions. It's going to be around 
people's perception of how they could produce an increased risk for them in addition to the relaxation of the social distancing rules. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's the that's an interesting one. And I, I certainly talk to a lot of you know friends and younger people where they're they're almost like, look, you know, let me chuck me in a room of people, let me get it out the way and and deal with it kind of attitude. But but the then on the other side, I think which is becoming more apparent is oh shit, you know, I've got parents and grandparents and and that sort of thing. You know, it's not about me. It's about the other people, and I, I think you're right. I think that's that's the sort of, you know, that's the funny. This, no, I wouldn't call it a funny thing, but that's that's the unusual thing about it is you, you know, you you've got to now start to think of all the other people that you know that you're likely to kind of um, impact if you know or you don't know about it, which which I think is what's, you know, what's what's going to kind of, uh, you know, put a, put a very different spin on on how people go back afterwards. Yeah, people people are going to, people are going to have a they're going to be risk adverse, maybe not for themselves, but for the impact of others. And mm. it, you know, this is a it's it's a it's a challenging one because when we come out of social distancing, the people that we will probably spend an increased period of time with will be the members of our family that may be more vulnerable on the basis that we haven't seen our parents for a long time, we haven't seen aunties and uncles, and it is that increased exposure to those individuals along with the increased risk that we may place on ourselves, which could end up being one of the primary drivers. So mm. as, a, as an organization, it is imperative that I am even now communicating out to the members and the prospective members of my business what plans we have in place. That can come in the form. At the moment, we've got plenty of COVID-19 guidance all over websites. We all seem to have used the same uniform banner at the top. But what that mostly talks about is membership suspensions or what to do if you've got a membership in currently or the lockdown. We need, and if we haven't, we need to be preparing for the next stage. The next stage will not come dramatically and quickly but it is going to come relatively suddenly. And every organization needs to have in place the type of operational procedures and communication now so that they've got the capacity to press the button at the right time so that they can bring that into play. One of the other challenges is with many of the staff within these organizations being let go, communication's currently breaking down there's not the ability to be able to telephone X, who's currently home working before they come back, to be able to explain to them the process, the procedure, or just to understand what they believe the best practice could be in this particular area. Mm. I think, you know, coming back to your, your earlier point, I think that um, that sort of uncertainty in terms of what it means and the lack of good data, as we talked about at the beginning, it, it is difficult because you've almost got to assume the worst that this is super contagious and you, you know you've, you you can't really be around people a lot, particularly at people at risk. So you know putting a plan together in in the the sort of fitness industry where you have got to be distant is a is is a very tough one. And I, I suppose um, I suppose you know the, the the sooner the the data and the information that that the governments get about what you know how this really affects you, and it seems to change. On a regular basis, you know, you, you, you know, this, this it seems to be coming in from all different areas, you know, and it's <laughs> it's like where where does it stop? But I, I guess you know, building a building a plan on uncertainties not not um, an easy one. So with with that said, then you know, and with with obviously talking about you know what comes you know what what comes after lockdown. What what are some of the things that you think uh, are important in terms of this ramp up? Because as you said, most businesses now have have furloughed most of their staff. Um, I guess you know the first thing they've got to do is get get people back into the business. So have you have you sort of thought through any of that? And is there any things off the top of your mind that that are interesting to share in terms of that sort of ramp up period? I, well, I, I think the the fitness industry has a very large quantity of um, self employed um, uh, operators. You know, particularly in the PT environment. I think. In, in the UK, if I was to, I, I won't understand, I don't understand any of the, the federal packages which are put in place in the United States, so I won't try to quote for them. But 
when it comes to the UK, the, the large majority of staff have been furloughed um, and, and therefore, therefore, you know, they are effectively resting. They are ready for redeployment when it comes around. I don't think this is going to be a employment challenge. I think reestablishing operations is going to be relatively simple. Um, my, my one concern, let's just take it back. Um, you would like to believe that um, the shock to the system in the time being used currently, that organizations have got a good understanding of what can kill them over the next nine months. And the only real thing that's going to kill them over the next nine months is the same thing that kills any business. You run out of cash. And the, the, and you know, there will be some that have already run out of cash. And, and that, that's sad. And there's probably some very good early, early stage ones which will not continue through. However, all organizations now, the most diligent document they should have has got to be a cash flow forecast. And that cash flow forecast has to be to a degree of accuracy that they would not have possibly contemplated ever utilizing before because they didn't need to worry about a margin of error of four or five, six, seven or eight percent. The difference now is that the, an organization needs to know where absolutely every penny and dollar is going on the revenue side, sorry, on the cost side. But what they also need to do is they need to plan for a variety of revenue situations going forward. It would be foolish to say we're back in operation by June at 80%. We're up to 100% by September, and that's it good for the year. <laughs> yeah. We have to take into account very, very clearly that there has been a significant shift within our existing revenue base, because even in this last four weeks, people who had the capacity to no longer continue with us are not likely to come back to our premises. We can increase that revenue reality with those that are now worried about attending on the basis that there are significant challenges, whatever around hygiene or whatever else they perceive those ones to be. In addition to that, some people are going through a change in economic and financial circumstances. Mm. That may well benefit some significant parts of our industry. I do personal opinion, I believe that the, the budget clubs will probably recover a great deal faster than the higher end clubs because they, the, the amount of, of uh, discretionary spend utilized there is significantly less. So an organization needs to look at its revenue and it needs to kind of throw out the model that it had previously. And it needs to do a look at some what if scenarios. What if only? What if only? So a very simple uh, type of model here doesn't require AI. There's no machine learning aspect of it is that if we take a look at the membership and the revenue that we were receiving when we went into lockdown, and if we were to then detract or subtract from that, every member that has the option to not continue with us in the next three to four to six weeks on the basis that their contract is no longer valid or is, is just moving on. And then in addition to that, we take a look at those that are likely in the next four weeks after that we're going to get a much accurate understanding of what our overall membership is. If that is on a per month basis or an annual contracts or whatever, then we've got a luxury that many providers won't have. But to then suggest that, let's say we are fortunate enough to come away with a, an average club losing between five and 8% on a monthly basis, most of them will tell you it's 2 and 3%. Trust me, it's not. 5 and 8% on a monthly basis. There'll be a number of them that will be higher than that. Realistically, when we come in in June, which would be a, a relatively optimistic date for an operations recommence in the fitness industry, I would suggest, I would guess that between 30 and 40% of membership are no longer contractually obliged or engaged with the club anymore. 
you know, I, I, I'll get hammered for some of those projections. They'll be looked at horrific. Go kid yourselves. I don't give a shit, right? I mean, if you want to go and pretend you're only going to lose 5%, good on you, right? Most of you have been kidding yourselves for years. You haven't been losing 30 40%. So it doesn't really bother me. But the reality is that you're going to see a large percentage are not coming back. And if you've got cash flow forecasts, which are based around any of those uh, optimistic outlooks, then you're going to hit a cash flow hill later on, which is going to be damaging, particularly when you start to take into account the fact that you're likely to go into another lockdown. And then if you also take into account, what do we believe the sales environment is going to look like? I, I heard someone say the other day that we're probably entering into the largest pre-sales in history, <laughs> or we're not. And you can look at that either way. That is to suggest that all of these people that are coming out of contract that are no longer engaged or committed to an organization are going to be going back looking for a new provider. In many mm -hmm. cases, if the existing provider is doing a good job, they've got a high probability that they'll be able to get them back anyway. Yeah, um, apologize, by the way. You can probably see visually at the moment. I am being dazzled by a British sunset. It's a rarity, I'll be <laughs> frank, this time of year. But if you're wondering how my uh, my uh, video has gone so uh, contrasted, it is due to the fact that to my left-hand side, I have an absolutely spectacular red sky developing at the current time. <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful moment there in the middle of the interview. In um, so so coming back to that, and I, I think that's an interesting point because I. You're right. You can look at it on on both sides. I suppose there's certainly, from what we've seen, we we predominantly deal in the B two B club market, but we also are involved in the consumer. And the consumer side has gone crazy, and it and it continues. Uh, a lot of my friends also have um, fitness businesses that that just focus on that side. And it's and it's got to a stage where pretty much everybody that's selling products are have, have totally wiped out of stock, and now they're all trying to get get products in so there seems there's, there's definitely a demand on um f for fitness and i'll come back to the sort of social media side in a in a moment but I, I i guess it's it's you know with that with with people probably appreciating the importance of health and fitness more than ever and they realize that you know they need to keep in shape even if it's just to fight off things like like corona do you think that um that you know, I guess the need's probably not going to go away. But do you think instead of spending sort of 30 or 40 a month um, on a health club membership, they, they may think, well, actually, I've, you know, it's more convenient to work at home. I've either got my Peloton or my, my fitness app or whatever. And, and people's behaviors could also change in terms of where they get their fitness fix from. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I am. I. I have multiple thoughts on it. I, I'm, I, I'm not pessimistic for the bricks and mortar business. I do firmly believe in the power of the community. I do firmly believe in the power of the experience. And I do not think that digital is going to be a replacement for bricks and mortar. So there I said it, right? Um, and I'm a Peloton user, right? So, you know, that, 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 and, and, and that, that is a, a reality, right? Um, what I, I do think is that, organizations, I think that what is going to stop the industry getting back is going to be more around the health concerns. I, I don't think it's because they've been watching, you know, um, the digital comparison out there at the moment and feeling that that is sufficient for them. Um, I think that there are larger elements of the industry which are important and are drivers to people's continued involvement in them. And I don't think that the digital offering is going to take away from that. Do I think it will impact? Y yes, definitely. I mean, there, you know, particularly when you've got products like the Pelotons and Tunnels, et cetera, I think there's going to be elements of that. But in many ways, I think the digital offerings, particularly on the online workouts, I think that they will become very much complementary. Um, I'm not suggesting, please, that every single gym starts to do a digital offering. I can just imagine the amount of crappy content that's already out there. And I can imagine it's going to get 50 times better. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why Peloton call themselves a media production company, right? They're not a fitness company. 
And the, the reality is that it's hard work to produce consistent, high quality content like that. But do I think that we will see an increased importance around fitness? Yes. Do I think that um, people will have increased habit around working out at home? Yes. But I also think that could drive a lot of people back into and people who were not in the gyms previously into the gym because people will have reestablished a habit that they want to progress and they can do that through the use of a PT, by use for more sophisticated equipment, or just by going to Group X classes. So mm. I think that what's happening at the present time is likely to balance out in many respects. And you could argue currently that a lot of the purchases that are being made are discretionary spend supported by the fact that people are not having to go and pay per class type packages currently with other organizations because they can't. Mm, yeah, interesting. I, I, I think there's some some good um, good points there on, on on both sides of the argument, and um, you know potentially some opportunities there. What one of the things that that came into my mind? We we spoke before we started about you know the the M and A market, and um, I, I wanted to sort of touch on two sides of that. You know, probably one um, what you you know what you what you see sort of happening in that world, and then two as it relates to the current. Uh, thing that we're talking about, you know, in terms of these sort of in in club bricks and mortar and out of club digital, you know, do you do you see there being opportunities for businesses to, you know, maybe traditional bricks and mortar to to be, you know, looking at acquiring, um, you know, companies where they can sort of, you know, bring those two sides together in a in a very high quality way. So you've got, you know, dedicated production companies offering digital stuff and a bricks and mortar and you know bringing those together you kind of you know you're in a an, in, an interesting space so there's kind of two questions in there but you know maybe start with you know what what you're seeing in that space and you know what kind of um signals is you know are, are worth sharing okay well st on the MA side i think um we're going to see we're going to see a lot of activity. Um, I, I, we, we touched on beforehand. You know, I, I'm I'm aware that there are two uh, investment banks currently that um, are operating specifically to be looking for distressed assets over the next six months in the industry. And there's every expectation that there, there will be a, a number of them. I think we're already seeing a number of high profile ones currently, which is struggling. And, you know, the, you, know the, you, you certainly have certain ones like, you know, the likes of Equinox, that are 180 million on the balance sheet. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but the, the, there will be organizations which just don't. Um, I, I think that there will be, um, we, we started to see the box within a box type situation or the boutique within the, uh, the big box. Um, and I'm sure many of the bigger boxes looked at some of the boutique offerings beforehand and thought, wow, if only we'd been there first or hmm. it's a really tight concept, that's great. And maybe they've even you know, started engaging conversations. But you know, any entrepreneur that was uh, starting out on that particular journey at that stage would have said, no, thank you. We've got big plans. We're just about to go out there and see if we can get some investors. We've got plans to go for five to 10 to 20, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's over. That's not happening anymore. It's not happening anytime soon. And the uh, particularly in the boutique marketplace where you've got the per class, pay as you go type model, you are operating of significantly lower margins or cash at hand. So the probability is that we're going to see a lot of casualties in that area. Um, the the ones that were developing strong, the ones that had strong concepts, the ones that looked like that they were likely to grow legs, um, we could well see them being acquired by some of the larger big box assets. Um, the mid market that was whimpering to dying in many respects under pressure from both the, the big box and the boutique, they may look to consolidate their offerings by getting involved in a number of, of areas in there. And I, I certainly would not write off seeing a one of the major European budget operators moving in and making an acquisition of another major European operator, maybe of, you know, maybe their 25, 30, 40 percent size of the actual acquirer on the basis that some have got some good cash on the balance sheet good relationships with their bankers and others, not so much. 
Um, and you know, anytime something like this happens, when the tide goes out, we generally get to see those that are not wearing their bathing costumes. And there are going to be quite a few, and some which are going to quite frankly surprise people. And with that being the case, between the investment bankers that will still see value, particularly if they can reorganize the cost infrastructure that would come from a, you know, a voluntary um, a liquidation that type of arrangement, then you know, the reality is that we'll see some further consolidation. Um, one of the... Just, you, sorry, you sorry, just, the just, go on. just on that for a second, you know, do, in terms of strategic, and I'm just throwing ideas around here, but I suppose if you are a... A smaller business, um, and you know you've you're in that position, like you said, where you know you're struggling for cash, but you've got a you've got a strong model. You know, are these interesting? You know, whilst we're in this position, are are these interesting things to be thinking about? Where it's like, okay, well, I've got a strong boutique concept. You know, there's a mid market club there, and and have it. You know, sort of instigating those conversations with people that are trying to you know, refinance a deal and almost, you know, kind of be putting some of these deals together because it's, it, you know, it sounds like with uh, with what's going on there, you know, there are opportunities to probably, you know, put a, a group of small emerging businesses together and to create something that could come out of it in a very strong position. You know, what's, what do you think yeah. about that? Well, I, I think if I was a mid-market operator currently and I was moving into a struggling financial territory, where I was uh, unsure of whether I would have the operational strength to see through many more of these events over the next six to nine months, then going to my bankers and my investors and suggesting that they provided me more cash to try and help me see through this is a very different proposition than actually going and taking a look at maybe where some of the weaknesses were in the business and bringing together some other parties. I mean, you, you and I will both know of some very strong boutique concepts, which do have the potential, but they're either at the early stage or they haven't yet had the opportunity to get some decent capital behind them. But the, the, the challenge in the marketplace being, you know, capital has been free for a number of years now, right? It is to all intents and purposes. And it has resulted in some phenomenally bad decisions relative to expansion and growth and the building of the sites. So that's where the Darwinian aspect comes into it. It's not a bad thing to see a reduction in operators, particularly inefficient operators. That's just business, right? And I don't think that's a bad thing. It doesn't mean that there will be casualties at the member level. It will mean that the stronger businesses, the businesses that are offering the value, the businesses that we want to represent the industry will have a bigger opportunity to grow themselves. And that's particularly important in bricks and mortar because in the bricks and mortar businesses, they are going to have to evolve, not just because of what has happened, but because we've got organizations out there currently that have got so much money on their balance sheets. I mean, we only have to look at Apple and Netflix and these guys. If they want to enter into our marketplace, if they want to bring together a you know, a comprehensive digital offering with media production and the bricks and mortar, just like Amazon with Whole Foods, they can do so and they can do so without it even being a touch on the balance sheet. And that, if you to, you could be the lucky one that you get the mm -hmm. telephone call and Tim Cook says, you're the one we're buying you tomorrow and you guys are going to become our new fitness offering. That's fantastic. But when you're not, you're then competing with Apple. Right. You're then competing with Google. You're then competing with Netflix. You're competing with distribution companies that know how to produce, who've got cash on the balance sheet and have got phenomenally strong teams when it comes to content creation. So they're looking for distribution and that's the bricks and mortar aspect of it. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited as a spectator to understand what the likes of Apple Lululemon, and all of these type of players that are around the marketplace have vested interests in seeing it be successful, whether it be Apple through the watch or whether it be Lululemon through its apparel, that they want to move into being more integrated within the industry. And to do that, that's likely to come through acquisition. It's mm. not likely to come from, from any of the old tired brands as such. They're more likely to go and move into something. I mean, a, a logical one. 
you know, call me mad and, and I'm just throwing it out there. Orange Theory with Apple, there's an awful lot of synergy in certain aspects of it. You know, there's been the tie-in from day one on that aspect. Not suggesting I've got any any knowledge of that to be the case. But when you when you look at, for instance, Orange Theory's uh, broad base, and I know obviously the franchise model adds a massive complication to that overall. But again, if I am holding a franchise for Orange Theory and I suddenly find out that the master franchise holder is Apple, am I pissed off? Probably not, right? I can probably see the benefits in that. But I do think that we're going to see more players, and I could name another four or five, Under Armour will be another one as well. Nike's an obvious one at some stage, as is Adidas, that will start to get involved because they need to have more influence over the way their brand is marketed. And the influencer marketing aspect of it, which has been very, very successful in many cases. Take Gymshark as a prime example again. When you and I met, um, yeah, you know, it right. seems like forever, which is only a couple of weeks ago, the following day, Gymshark opened for the first time ever, as you'll be aware, because you, you interviewed Mark the day before, their first pop-up store in Covent Garden. And they had downstairs, right, Gymbox, right? And, you know, that, that actual uh, uh, tie-up was a very logical one. And we're going to see more apparel, just like we've seen them with the wearables, we're going to want to see them take the wearables plus the apparel and then move that even into an online digital offering, but then probably supplemented because there's revenue behind it and it's good supporting into the bricks and mortar aspect of it. And mm. that's why I think that when you look at our industry now, we won't recognize it in 24 months. By the end of the year, we'll be thinking, how the hell did that happen in many cases? And we'll mm. be surprised at the consolidation. We'll be surprised at who didn't survive. We'll be surprised at who is doing really, really well. But then you move that forward 12 months further, it's going to look completely different again. We're now on a very fast road to change. And organizations that adapt and organizations that understand that are going to benefit very significantly. Organizations that don't, yeah, bye-bye. Mm. We, we, we kind of covered this a little bit in our previous interview, but do, do you think that what's happened now at the moment with, with the current situation, do you think that's just really accelerated things that, that we've all been talking about for a long time? Like there's nothing in this conversation really – that's that's new and that's not out there. It's just the speed that it's probably now going to consolidate and and you know change into something else that we'd all probably put on the back burner up until and up until now. Yeah, completely right. So th this is a, a beforehand. You could ignore certain signals that you could see in the industry because you could kick that can down the road and either hope something wasn't going to happen or maybe it's going to be two, three years away, right? That, that, was primary, that was the primary attitude on most. As an industry, we were still getting excited about being able to offer a mobile app about 12 months ago. So, you know, let, let's not suggest that we are at the forefront of technology in most aspects. Even operationally, there's a great deal of improvements that could be done in when you look at comparison with other industries. However, I think that what we've now got in place is when, when the pause button went on, what I hope happened was that leaderships in many organizations were given a different viewpoint or at least an opportunity to give more consideration to their business. I know I did. I know the first time when this was announced, when I realized that there was no longer going to be anybody to speak to on the end of the telephone for a period of time, it was. It, it is an utterly unique situation for any business to be able to sit down now and fully plot out what they believe the impact could be, the scenarios that could happen. We'd all like to think we do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's too challenging. There's too much going on. We're running our business. We're running our lives, and we're running at 100 miles an hour. Currently, that's not the case for the vast majority and therefore, the opportunity to start looking into what things could look like, what the possibility to do this is, what would be the impact if that happened? Do we have the capability to go and put a digital offering on? Is our brand strong enough for us to start charging for a commercial digital offering? Right? Should we be looking at consolidating with another brand? What brands do we think are going to struggle that we could go out and possibly acquire? Right? 
all of these questions are strategic questions that may, may get asked at a board meeting on a quarterly basis for an hour and from an offsite review on maybe a day on an annual basis. And the depth they'll go into is no more than confirm that the question probably should be answered, but they'll kick the can down the road for another year. Not now. Mm. We're into four weeks now. We've got a, 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 we're going to have ours extended tomorrow. Presumptions probably after the half term, May the 6th, May the 8th, along those lines. That still gives every business leader in this industry, from the geography I'm speaking from at the moment, the biggest largest proportion of time they will get in their careers to deliberate what direction their business could be in. Mm. Any of them that in 12 months time sit there and say, well, that was a bit of a surprise. I'm going to guess are the ones that are not going to be in business for too much longer because this is an opportunity. It just depends on whether you want to take it because yeah, you know, realistically, it's hard at the moment. We get it. Everybody does. It's hard for everybody. But there is a necessity to plan forward. And if they don't plan forward, they won't get this opportunity again. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with you on that. You know, there's taken away the, you know, a lot of the terrible stuff that, that's come along with it. You know, just trying to look at the the silver lining. I, I, I totally agree with you, you know, being able to step away from the business and, and 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 think and and get you know have have your team thinking about these ideas you know we've we've spoke for a short while today and there's a number of different scenarios that have popped into my mind that I hadn't thought about and you know there there is some you know certainly the one of the things you can't take away from is that people's health I, well I believe anyway people's health is going to become more an important part of, of their lives than it ever had been so even the people that weren't into health and fitness are probably realizing that they need to be a little bit healthier and fitter and and so i think the circle certainly increased in terms of that it's it's really a case of um you know how you create a, a relationships and and provide services in this you know in this new world of which i think is a you know is is, is a bigger opportunity for everybody um Coming, I wanted to sort of, you know, move over to social media. Now, you've, I believe, you've, you've got a social media business. Is that right, Ian? Still, or are you yeah, about to I, start it? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> There's that too. Uh, I, I localize. Yeah, I've had localized. Sorry, if I'm not allowed to say that, I'll, I'll let it that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1982. 1982. Now you got my mind going. In 2012, right? So I, I've had that for for quite a long time, and basically. Um, Localize was a, a platform predominantly used by big agencies, but also used by many of the brands as well. But effectively, it's utilized to understand which social media content is resonating, what's the performance, etc. So, yes, I, I've had that for quite a bit. It's used by an awful lot of the, the, the fitness brands as well. Yeah. So so what we, what are some of the things that you're seeing as it specifically relates to the fitness community you know I've, i certainly have, have seen there's a lot of um I, I guess fitness trainers pumping out workouts and exercises and that type of thing but what are you seeing from the big fitness brands in social media you know are there are, are, are they grasping it and pumping out a lot of material or have they gone underground what what are some of the key trends that, that you've picked up on that on that point i i did um yeah, you know, I was having a conversation with um, my PR firm, um, Dawn Action PR, and, and, and Dawn and I were saying that uh, you know it was imperative that communication was logically going to be one of the major uh, pillars for uh, member communication going forward. It always is. So, and in particular in this period, right? You've got to keep them. You've got to keep people engaged now. For, for everyone that's putting online Zoom classes or maybe moving it to another level of professionalism, there's still a necessity for communication on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I did was I did, did the research and we took a look at the post frequency of the, um, of the I won't say the, let's just say um, 25 of the largest operators um, in the world. And uh, what we found was uh, very simply that their frequency has gone through the floor. Um, they are actually communicating significantly less in April than they did in March. And in March, they were doing it significantly less than they were doing it in February. So um, I, I, you know, the, the utilization um, by certain brands has increased quite considerably. 
there was a number of, of, of UK brands that really surprised me that they had done 400% increase in their social media activity, um, which is a challenge, by the way, because, you know, trying to keep quality, trying to keep good voice, those type of things are a big challenge. Mm -hmm. But there was also a significant majority of them in the overall group that had stopped being active altogether um, or were putting out basic public information notices or using Carver and throwing a motivation quote on there well below their usual standard. The, you know, I, I suppose that's understandable. Maybe, maybe the marketing team no longer exists. Maybe they're gone, yeah. right? Maybe you know, that, that, that is the, the aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but can I just go back to that cash flow forecast? If you've been ignoring your members for the previous four weeks, do not expect them to be knocking on your door looking to rejoin up right there because you may have been, but there are others that are not. It's not just Joe Wicks doing his on his daily basis and his classes that were, you know, that have taken the UK by storm. There are many, many operators that are doing incredibly good jobs, even in a amateurish but enthusiastic way to be able to engage their membership. And what this has done in many ways is developed a bunker mentality around the members and the brand that we're in this together and we're going to come out of this together. There may be in those that are already quite strong towards the brand and increased strength. And there may be some on the periphery that feel stronger association because they got to see the less polished version of the product but they got to see something which is very genuine, which is what social is supposed to be about. If all you did was to serve a post to say that all memberships are suspended, keep safe, and we hope to see you soon, good luck at trying to get people back. Because the beauty of social is that people are sharing their experiences and they're sharing them in this sense as well as everything else. And the utilization of hashtags and the utilization of different channels has meant that some brands are increasing their audience. In March, across a number of brands, I saw between 10 and 15% audience increases with zero paid activity, meaning that many of them had decreased, for obvious reasons, the Facebook ads and the Instagram ads they were running to do their sales generation. But they were getting an increase in organic likes or follows. The only thing that I can put that down to is an increased quantity of content of sufficient quality or of interest that has brought new people to the brand. And those individuals, those brands have got a capacity to then convert that into paying customers in whatever form they choose to at a much higher rate than those that are not doing anything at the moment. Mm. I think that's an interesting and another interesting point you mentioned there, Ian, you know, I, I, I certainly heard that the the costs because people are not advertising. You know, the cost to advertise on social media has dropped. So you know, it's it's quite a good time to be, um, you know, grabbing opportunities out there from a from a cost perspective. And I, I think you know one of the things that and I, I'd be interested in your views on this. But one of the things that we've tested a lot is we create these beautiful videos and spend a lot of time editing them. And they're you know kind of very very proud of them when they go out. And I think a lot of companies do that, but Certainly, when you look at, as, as, as I'm sure you've done, a lot of data and a lot of different content, certainly with the key social media platforms, it's the stuff that you you do in your living room from your phone and you post it out. That's the stuff that people seem to want. So I suppose, you know, any, anybody can probably get into this at the moment, even if they've got some trainers sitting in the house in their slippers, it, it, yeah. it, it probably connects you. What 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 are you, you know, you've, you know a lot more than this, than I do, but what what's your sort of takeaways or your advice with with this sort of opportunity on social media as everybody is locked down and they've probably not got budgets at the moment? I, well, you, you pointed it out yourself. So the, the, there is two two aspects. There are those of us that are going to look for a digital class or a digital engagement so that it can help us with our fitness, but we shouldn't take away from the opportunity it presents us with to also to position the brand and to, to, to put some brand voice out into social overall. So, you know, the utilization of Instagram stories, TikTok, whatever you may choose to do, the abbreviated format 
allows the opportunity to be able to give it. Now, um, if I use a, a Peloton example, and you know, it's kind of an unofficial Peloton example in a way because you've got Peloton and then you've obviously got the, the talent, right? You've got the talent, which is which are the, uh, the team that are actually taking the classes. Their ability to build brand for Peloton is incredibly strong because the content that they're placing at the moment is giving us a window into the challenges which they're having, even the challenges of them actually doing Peloton classes before they actually stopped it doing it altogether. The brands are always very, very protective. But if you're not doing anything, you're not doing anything. In many cases at the moment, one of the strengths of the necessity to do this at home type stuff by your trainers is to actually work to build up the trainer themselves, to give the trainer the support and the infrastructure so that they can help to do it. I think Pure Out in, in, in Asia has done an incredibly good job. They've been delivering great content consistently, free of charge over Instagram during that particular time. But it's still got the feel of the quality. And you know there are certain providers in our industry, you guys are one of them, where your hallmark is always your production quality. I would, you know, the, the most dubious video I ever expect to see out of you is you jogging on the beach when you're doing one of your own on your personal side of things. And that would never get through your marketing team, I'm pretty sure, right? Because of the, you know, the standards of production you guys have are very, very high. However, when you don't have the capacity to do that production, providing additional guidance into your instructors about maybe utilization of the brand, maybe to you know have the logo in the top right of that font, actually giving them the formats and those type of things can allow them to raise their game, suggesting to them the hashtags that they could be utilizing on there, yeah, it's getting them to understand that it's how you start and how you end that many people will remember, not the stuff that goes on in the middle. And then also looking, you know, if I'm a if I'm looking after social at the moment, I'm planning a content calendar, and that content calendar is going to have by necessity two things. It's going to have the content that would be expected by a member to keep them engaged. And then, as well as let's say the public interest stuff, let's move towards the humor aspect as well. You know, there are there, there is lots of opportunities, even if it's engineered within the organization itself to add elements of humor, to share a human aspect of the brand so that people can associate. In the fitness industry, now more than ever, the success is not the brand, it is the people that work within the brand. Therefore, if you want to have a strong brand, you need to be investing in your people. Perversely, that's exactly what hasn't happened because unfortunately, a great deal have had to be let go. And there's a great deal of individuals that probably are the brand that the brand currently does not have the ability to actually involve and get involved in. But when you do, or when you find an opportunity, you should utilize it and utilize that individual to actually be able to project what you want by giving them the resources, the skills, and the guidance to make sure that it stays genuine, realistic, but professional. Mm. Fantastic. So a couple of couple more questions um, that I'd like to finish off with. But just just before that, in, in terms of your I know you've got a number of businesses in, but your your fitness data business, um, one, it would be give, good just to give, you know, just to give a bit of an overview of, of what that business is. But also, you know, what are you what, what are you and your business doing whilst everybody's closed? And how are you, I suppose, sort of helping people for when they start to realize that the doors are going to open and um you know they need to be thinking about that so maybe maybe just sort of share a bit about about yourself and your business ian okay so um keep me has uh keep me was formed in december 2018 we've been around for about 18 months now we've got customers um, across eight countries um and we've got staff across six the organization is a revenue acceleration platform for the fitness industry, and it utilizes artificial intelligence and the data that exists within an organization to be able to provide actionable insights along with providing the tools to go and do something about it. So let's break that down into a very simple format. Keep Me can utilize the data within your business 
to understand the probability on whether a member will still be with you in 12 months time to a very high degree of accuracy. So it opens up a window of opportunity to change the outcome. Now, in addition to that, we employ artificial intelligence to be able to do predictions across a variety of areas. An example could be where we're looking to increase secondary spend. We use the artificial intelligence to, uh, to identify the members within your organization who'd have a high probability of wanting to purchase the secondary aspect that you're looking at, PT. But let's take it one level more. Let's say that, for instance, we had a class pack of five PT sessions that we wanted to push out. What the platform does, it will not only identify those members that will purchase PT, but it will then tell you that Ian, for instance, he would purchase a 10 pack, um, but he would also purchase a 20 pack, right? Whereby in some cases, if you offered them a 10 pack, they're not going to purchase it because they'll only take a five pack. So the platform will then identify the probability. So not only are you identifying the members that will make the purchase, but then get the capability to be able to give them the offer at the right price level, and then even bringing in the right visual assets to make sure that I myself receive a male over 40 in the visual rather than a female under 25, as an example. All of these can be delivered on an automated basis and at scale. So the type of customers we have, you know, they, they range from uh, large multi-site international operators, boutique operators, to large single-site operators in the United States, like Harkison Athletic or Cedarvale over on the East Coast. These organizations use Keep Me predominantly to be able to have a good understanding of the current health of their membership, to be able to increase the retention of that membership and to be able to utilize the automation tools to make sure that they're making a variety of engagements at the right time in the right format day after day without the necessity to have a huge resource of doing so as a whole. So that gives you an idea of where we're at. With, with um, the current situation then, like, you, you know, obviously looking at uh, historical data to, to predict behaviors going forward, I guess, you know, you, we've had a lot of that, but with this kind of, you know, sort of throwing a spanner in the works, I guess, now. Can yeah. can can that AI, if that's what you call it, um, can that sort of look now at a new world and then sort of start putting predictions in place with, you know, some of the things that we spoke about at the beginning of this interview then, do you think? Yeah, and, and you know, Matt, it, it is already. So what we're doing for the customers at the moment is that I talked to you about the very simple model you could do about people not being active. You know, what, 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 what Keep Me is doing currently is it is looking at the memberships of the clients. And in, in doing so, it is telling them the probability of what customers will be in place by they took, come out. Not in that very rough way, in a much more accurate way, as well as giving them the understanding of the ones which they need to go to. So when we come out of this process, we're not going to be in a membership retention environment. That is not going to be, if it ever was, that is not going to be the industry focus. We're going to be in a sales environment because the existing membership base we've got coming out of this is unlikely to be sufficient to be able to support the revenue that we need on the cost base. Therefore, focus is going to be on revenue. In a Keep Me context, the clients will know which of their members they should be focusing on. And they should be focusing on them because they have been identified as being medium risk with the capability of wanting to stay if they get the relevant interactions, engagements, whatever else that may be in place. But more importantly, when it comes to being able to allocate sparse resources over many tasks when we come out, what it will also do is identify those members which, quite frankly, you need to you know, just move away from. That, you know, there, there is no impact that you're going to be able to do on that side. Um, going going forward, I mean, this is in a, uh, in, as we would have called it in the market, this is Black Swan, right? It's a Black Swan event. This was uh, an unpredictable in, in, in many, many cases. However, what this will prepare the models for is understanding the behaviors of members in subsequent. So, you know, hands up if you think we're going to have another Corona vice environment, not Corona 19, right? Sorry, not, not, you know, not COVID-19. We're likely to have another one. I mean, this is the fifth coronavirus. We're likely to see a great deal more over time. I think in the next five years, it would be unrealistic to think that we won't have another potential black swan event that could impact business. 
what these models have now got in place, just like they did when we had their financial crisis 08, 09, dot com earlier on than that, and indeed SARS before in, in between, we've now got increased data sets to get an understanding of probabilities, which means that businesses using tools like KeepMe are much better equipped to know their actual and highly probable position when they come out of lockdown rather than rudimentary 60-day inactive models and you know just guesstimates of how gut feel, which you know, beyond a boutique running 150 members, that's just not sensible, right? If you're operating at scale, you need to have a model that's telling you, you think you've got X members, you've actually got X minus 30, and out of those 70% that you've got left, 35% of them are the ones you need to contact and spend the time with because they're the ones that you can influence to stay, the rest move away. Mm, fantastic. So what's your, so based on, you know, you've, the information that you've had and and I, I guess on the data, um, uh, you know, looking at various different examples, what would be your your own Ian's prediction for what, you know, what, what things are going to look like in, you know, sort of end of, you know, December 2020? What, what, what do you see some of the sort of key things that, that are likely to be going on, you know, both from a, you know, specifically in the fitness industry, but in terms of where these businesses are going to be and what what's the state of the industry at that point? Um, what, what happens in the next 10 weeks will define. We, we're, we're still, from an economic perspective, we're still at a stage where we can recover in 2020 to probably close to Q1 type performance by the end in 2020, particularly in the United States, if over the next three to four weeks we get a, a handle on what is going on. If this extends... We shouldn't think that that's just going to extend into Q1. The impact's going to be much, much longer. The, the material impact to the fitness sector at the present time from prolonged shutdown, it's not a case of one month out equals one month getting back up. It's a, every day we're out, we're looking at six to nine weeks to trying to get back up again as we start to move out. So the... What what will occur? As I think, you know, I'm, I don't want to repeat myself here, Matt. But I mean, what's going to occur over the, the the next six months is we're going to see distress. We're going to see organisations coming out of it stronger. We're going to see consolidation. We're going to see some more ambition. We're going to be see some hopefully um, some more ideas creation, particularly around digital assets. We're going to see more partnerships. We're going to see organizations coming together that from different fields, different industries that are overall going to make, you know, media production companies or fitness companies, et cetera, which are going to produce. If, if my personal barometer is, and I am uh, accused to be an overtly optimistic individual in many <laughs> cases, my personal barometer currently is not that way inclined. Um, I am the pendulum is moving towards the neutral from the optimistic. And that's just because of time delay. Um, but that's also tainted by the fact that my exposure to organizations relates to the customers I actually engage with. So I'm obviously going to have sector specific um, analogies and, and, and understandings in there. Um, and I do see a lot of conversation currently more around what I believe to be nice to have behaviors around digital offerings than what fundamentally is going to be important. Cash is king, cash will run out. What can we do as an organization to make sure that our cash flow is suitably ring fenced to allow us to get through the next 12 months of ups, downs, and in betweens so that we've got a capacity even to be fighting in 12 months in the brave new world? rather than the other situation currently, which is that people are just going to peter out, disappear. And we'll get some, by the way, which will just see the closed notice go on the door because they probably didn't even see it coming themselves. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I think I think that's a great way to finish. And I, I think certainly, you know, just, just a simple thing is, you know, look at it, you know, plan that for, for being 12 months um, and, and, you know, get, get a plan in place for that that period of time because I, I think you know looking at I, th I think as like like a lot of us you know start you're looking at on a quarter by quarter basis think things will open up and assume it will go back to normal but it's yeah. particularly in our sector anyway that's certainly um 
you know, certainly unlikely to be a case. So if you can, if you can ensure you you're going to be around this time next year, then um, yeah, probably in a you're in a good position. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's not the the you, know, you you may remember a conversation we've had before. I've always found it highly amusing that every single year the fitness market seems to expand, which makes absolutely no bloody sense to me. I've never seen anyone saying, by the way, last year we contracted and there was less members, right? Because even though we've got aging populations in virtually every Western country, right? And even though the offerings are not in any way driven to it. So therefore, we do have a lower quantity of available people in our core market every year. We seem to grow, right? The reality in 2020 is because of the Darwinian forces that will be in place, we are going to find that the market, whilst it may potentially actually grow because there may be more people, you know, we may stubbornly move from that 17, 18 percent in the US up to 19, 20 because of new behaviors which are being done. But as an operator, if you're strong enough to get through this, if you can move yourself into what is going to happen in Q4 and Q1 next year, there's going to be more members available because there's going to be less operators that have the capacity to be able to take them because they're no longer in business. So it is horrible for some, but it is going to be a bonanza time for others and in you know, come to the end of December 2021, things may look very differently, but those that are left are likely to be stronger, more efficient, more operationally efficient, more innovative, and probably more open to development of their product well beyond what they would have considered pre what we've just gone through. Ian, thank you so much for your time. Been a great, uh, great conversation. And I look forward to releasing part one um, once we're out of this uh this situation. So thanks again and uh, best best of luck to um you know over the next couple of months until we open again. Great. Thanks very much Matt. Really enjoyed it as usual. Thank you. Thank you and thanks very much. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.